Uh, listen, uh, good morning ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm really pleased you could come here today. Uh, I think it's about 12 months since I last did one of these sessions, so I think it's uh, long overdue that we got together again and had another chat. Um, so that I can tell you what sort of how things have gone in that 12 months, what have been the big issues as far as I'm concerned. Um, but also, I think importantly, taken an opportunity through Chris Allison, who's, who leads on um, coordinating the security operation for the Olympics 2012 uh, across the country, an opportunity for Chris to talk a little bit about that. Uh, because there's not the slightest doubt this is going to be, uh, well, it is the biggest event on the globe. It's something that should interest all of us, all our communities, both the uh, the difficulties, the you know, the challenges that we're going to have, but also the huge opportunities that, that is here for sort of across the United Kingdom, and particularly for London. So I think that will be a particularly useful opportunity for Chris to give you some thoughts about uh, how how that's going and what the issues are. But before I hand over to Chris, I just wanted to touch on a number of issues. Uh, and forgive me if you've heard this before, but I, I did want to touch upon something that I've been passionate about since I took over as Commissioner of the Met. And that is what I call, what the Met calls, our five Ps. The thing that's driving uh, my thought process and a lot of our activity. And it, it's, in the five Ps are presence, performance, productivity, professionalism and pride. And I just want to take you briefly through those because I do think it's relevant to our discussions today. Presence. This is about maximising the opportunity for a Metropolitan Police Service to have a beneficial effect in people's lives. It is very much about uniform visibility on the streets and within our communities, but it's more than that. It's about how we maximise our specialist services, how they can be even more present for a beneficial effect in all our communities' lives so people feel supported so they can help us more. But let me just concentrate a little on that uniform presence that all our communities feel and want in their communities. Um, I, I made some comments last week where I said, historically, uh, people might be forgiven for thinking that, and I, I don't know if you know, Dennis O'Connor, the chief HMI constabulary, made the comments about sort of withdrawing from the streets. And I said, I can understand where Dennis is coming from. I understand that report. And historically, we, we have seen, I don't think we have seen sufficient concentration on having that uniform visible presence in our communities, on our streets, in our public places, making the public feel that they are safe and that we are doing our bit to support them so they can help us. So, but I then went on to say what we've been doing about it here in London and what the effects are. And I'm not going to be try, I don't want to sound complacent about this, but I do want to give a message that says we have made real improvements, but, but we can do more yet. That's the message I've, I've got. Really good stuff, but there's more left to do. And let me just talk about that uniform presence in our communities on our streets. And let's go back to the investment this city made, uh, yeah, the city made and the Met made, going back starting, I think it was six years ago, on the 1st of April six years ago, when we started to roll out safer neighbourhood teams. And we said then, having a team present within our communities who were a consistent team, who would make sure that we didn't abstract them like we did previously with other community policing schemes, who would be speaking to the public locally and regularly, effectively saying to them, what are your priorities? We'll go away and do them. We'll come back regularly. We'll tell you what we have done, what we haven't done, why we haven't done it, and when we're going to do it, or if we're not going to do it, and why, and discuss it with you and have that local agenda. And it was always about building confidence. Now, I want to come back to that, that, that thing about building confidence. So we rolled those out, and it took about two years to get to the full model, and that's been the, the full model has been there for about four years now. So that's the first thing, and that's been a huge investment and a massive increase of uniform presence within our communities, building confidence. And I'll come back to what I think the effects have been. But since I've been Commissioner, um, even down to the, the, the policy of going towards the default position of single patrol, so that we reduce the number of officers patrolling in twos and threes, and increase the number of officers who are doing foot patrol in our communities, um, feet on the pavement, and reduce the number of dual patrols so we can have, in effect, more visible uniform patrols in our communities and our streets. The effect of that single policy is now, is now seeing an additional 25,000 additional foot patrol hours, effectively, on our streets every week. Just that. 
And that is about, again, trying to build confidence in the public, in our communities, that we are there, given that uniform governance to public spaces so our communities can feel confident that they can do their bit to help us. Second, next, we have increased the number of foot patrols in town centres over a 12-month period by about half a million additional patrol hours on top of that. We've also hugely expanded the special constabulary scheme, which I'm passionate about. People who are fully trained, warranted police officers, but who do it essentially uh, as volunteers. We train them, and we've gone from a number of years ago, I think, I can't remember when, we had about 800 of these people, and we are very, very close to having 4,000. Again, adding that presence to the streets. So there are a number of the initiatives we've been taking, going right the way back to starting six years ago to more recently since I became Commissioner. So what's been the effect of that? Well, I still say there's much more left to do and I'm not complacent. But the effect has been that Londoners across our communities, Londoners have been telling us through our survey work that in terms of their concern over antisocial behaviour, it's reduced from 23% by to 12 to 13 percent in the last 12 months, almost a, harvi a halving of concern about antisocial behaviour. And antisocial behaviour affects all our communities. Doesn't matter whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you're in, whether you're Asian, whether you're Jewish. It is one of those things that affects all our communities. So a reduction in the concerns of antisocial behaviour locally is something that's important to all of us. And we've seen that almost halving because of what we've been doing over the last 12 months. Uh, but we are here for all communities and some of the things we've been doing has also seen as part and we've been measuring this part of our performance uh, tracking so increases in confidence and whilst again I want to increase the confidence more we have seen now more our latest results show that 63 percent of the public feel we are doing a good or excellent job now as an ambitious commissioner I would say I want it to be more than that but let's remember that five years ago that figure was down at 58% and we are seeing small increases in confidence year on year. The reason for that I think is because of our investment in safer neighbourhoods, our commitment to doing something different and actually delivering the promises we've been making. So I think that's been very good. Satisfaction across all our diverse communities has been improving. We are seeing increase in satisfaction with the services given across all our communities. Now I have to be honest and say there is still a gap between the satisfaction service that sort of coming from the, the sort of white communities as opposed to BME communities. The increase in satisfaction is the same, but there is still a stubborn, I think it's about a 5% gap, something like, this, uh, something like that. So that's, we've got to work hard to continue to close that gap. But all our communities, most have been seeing an increase in satisfaction. Um, so, I, so I think there is some really good news there. So I go back to my general mantra, which is really good, promising figures, it's much more to do and we mustn't be complacent. But of course we're doing all this in the face of some rather tricky, uh, a rather tricky financial climate. I don't need to lecture anybody here as the, as the challenges the country currently faces. Uh, there might be lots of differing political opinions of how we tackle this, but I don't know there's any differing opinion that this is not the position the country wishes to be in financially. And we in the police know we have got to take our fair share of responsibility for reducing costs. Um, so I face, we face in the Met, a very difficult financial future. But I will not make predictions on what effect that's going to be, other than if it's of the more challenging end and some of the figures we're hearing, then it is likely that the Met will shrink. But I will not make predictions and do shroud waving about, uh, uh, until I get the actual figures. And at the moment, I don't have the actual figures as to the budget situation we face. I'll get part of that when we get the... Uh, comprehensive spending review through in the next few weeks but even then there'll be many decisions to be taken at government level and at city hall level as to what is a strategy for dealing with what is a, a sort of a declining budgetary situation but it's going to be very challenging but the one promise I can make to you and make to all our communities in London that whatever we have to do my order of priority will be about prioritizing operational capability the policing services we deliver uh, now, I'm not lying to anybody, it is going to be very challenging. But our order of service, if you will, is looking at what my deputy calls the, inan inan uh, the inan inanimate objects first. Looking at how we can use our buildings cost, our vehicles cost, all those big costs 
that if we can reduce it, means we can maintain more of our operational capability. Next comes reducing our, our business support costs, the processes that support our operational people out there. And only after that do we start looking at operational capability. But it's going to be very challenging. But I'm determined to maintain as much of our operational capability as we can. And the general crime figures, actually there is, um, how do I say this, I'm always very careful not to be complacent and sound over, over self congratulatory about this, but there are some promising crime figures at this moment in time. We are seeing reductions in overall crime. This is police recorded crime, by the way, and I understand the argument about uh, there's a, a lot of crime goes unre unreported, and I've understood that and I've always understood as a police officer. We are seeing an overall reduction in crime across our communities. We are seeing reductions in, in the most serious violent crime, and I'll come back to the homicide bit in a moment, which is the most troublesome and challenging. But we are seeing reduction in crimes in knives used to injure. We are seeing a reduction in firearms offences reported. We are seeing a reduction in firearms discharge reported. So we're seeing significant reductions across that. And actually, and here's the really tricky piece, this year, we're at this moment, in this performance year, we're seeing reductions in hate crime across the piece. Now you've got to be careful with things like hate crime, because it's not one of those iceberg crimes. Uh, historically, domestic violence, hate crime, uh, sort of uh, religious, sort of faith-based crime, ethnicity-based crime, that's always been very much underreported. Now, we've done huge amounts to try and increase the reporting of that and actually change our computer systems, which I think we told you about some time ago, going back to 2008, when we changed our what's called our CRIS system, our reporting system, to better identify different categories of hate crime. Now, at the moment, reports of those are going down, but I do recognise there is still a big element of underreporting, like there is in other crime, and it's our job to make sure we encourage people to come forward, let us know the true picture so we can take the best action on it. So there are some very promising crime figures, but against that, we have seen this challenge around young people killing young people. We've seen this challenge about youth murders in our community, and not to mention that would be an, an outrage for a commissioner. I have to mention that. Now again, if we look at the figures, and by the way, one such murder is one too many. You, you don't have success, you can't talk about success in young kids being murdered if there is one young kid being murdered. But in terms of the figures, uh, this year, on the calendar year, uh, I'm trying to look for figures here somewhere, I think we have seen 15 in, the, in this calendar year against a figure of 12 in the previous calendar year. Now that was an extraordinarily low figure because the year prior to that and the year prior to that it was significantly more than currently this year. But my, my view is, albeit if we look at a four year trend, we are still lower than two out of, the th two, two out of those years, uh, it is still far too many. It is right that people continue to maintain pressure on me to do everything we can to support communities, to target our resources, to target our patrols, to do the, to the, uh, the maximum effect to stop these murders, to make sure we get a message through to our young people about the carriage of knives is a really, really, really dumb choice. And that if you do it, you are likely to be searched, caught, and the consequences are serious. So that we can do something for communities and for parents in communities to say we, it is our job to do everything we can to make those streets as safe as they can be for your kids. However, there is a bigger picture. I do not do social engineering. I think on occasions the police have dabbled too much in social, enge social <coughs> engineering. We should su be supporting social engineering schemes, but we are not the lead social engineering agency. And the prevention aspect around these crimes starts very early. And it's beyond the remit of the police to actually be the lead on that. We need to have a debate that's m as much about how we go into long-term prevention. What are the... What, what are the social drivers? What are the social policy issues that actually that we could actually that government could that the mayor could that various politicians could that communities could concentrate on that actually concentrate on the most important thing and that is prevention. I'm at the back end of the business. I'm into that kind of um, sweeping up at the back, trying to discourage at the back. The real issue is preventing. How do we get the right family set up, the right support for the parents at the right time, get the right inclusion policies in schools, all those things that are so important to get our kids to make the right choices uh, so that they do not put themselves in the way of peril. Uh, I think I've said enough about some of my views about how things have been going over recent 12 months. 